And welcome to another powerful edition of the Community Defender Talk Show. One powerful hour of truth, Dave Foster. I'm Brother Oscar. Hey, Brother Darrell. We're very glad that you have tuned in to the Community Defender Talk Show. And as usual, we have a very powerful show planned for you. As you can remember or recall, uh, we did do uh, the subject of Malcolm X Reloaded, where we featured the lecture of uh, Minister Abdul Muhammad from the city of Chicago, and we played a very long 20 or 30 minute excerpt of his lecture uh, to enlighten the viewing audience about a, another more truthful, truthful perspective of the Malcolm X history. And of course we were uh, graced by Almighty God to be able to get this brother to actually come down from the city of Chicago and assistant minister to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Brother Minister Abdul Muhammad, to enlighten us further on the subject of Malcolm X and that history. We want to thank you, brother, for coming to the yes, studio. Sir. Thank brother. you for having me, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, brother. And we, we want to really get, I uh, guess, right into uh, the topic of Malcolm X. You know, a lot of people uh, have gotten their history, as you've said, you know, about Malcolm X from the movie, because most people really did not uh, read the book. Right, right. But I, I, wanna, I want you to tell us briefly, um, how did uh, Malcolm X influence your life? Well, uh, Brother Daryl and Brother Oscar, Malcolm X influenced my life because the reason that I'm a Muslim today, the reason that I joined the Nation of Islam to follow the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is because I read the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And reading that autobiography inspired me so much that I decided to make a change in my life and become a registered member of the Nation of Islam. Before that, I was involved in a lot of illegal activity, getting in various confrontations with police, and you know, I grew up in the South, um, so I got into a lot of confrontations with racist white people in the South. And I was out there with no guidance, no direction, and one day I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and that book made me want to become a Muslim. And shortly thereafter, I became a registered member of the Nation of Islam. Yes, sir. Inspired by that book. Yes, sir. Brother Oscar. Well, uh, well, well tell me this, brother. Um, do you believe that Malcolm X is a, is, a, is a great man, a good man? Brother, I believe that Malcolm X, while he was in the Nation of Islam and working for the upliftment of our people, was a very great man, a very good man who did a lot of work to help to build the Nation of Islam under the guidance and direction of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X is the one that started what we call fishing in the nation of Islam, going out actively, bringing our people to the truth and to the light of Islam. Malcolm X started that. Malcolm X is the one that originated the honorable Elijah Muhammad being referred to as the honorable Elijah Muhammad. He's the one who started that. So Malcolm X did a lot of great things why he was in the nation of Islam and you know the Holy Quran says that Allah does not waste the work of any worker so that would include our brother Malcolm X. Right. How, how, how do you believe that the, the training that, that, that Malcolm X may have received inside of the nation of Islam and, and the discipline and the military structure of the nation of Islam, how did that contribute to the actually making Malcolm the man that he, that he was? Brother, there's no way that Malcolm X being a Negro, see a lot of people forget where Malcolm X came from, right? Go ahead. See, Malcolm X was a man who grew up like most of us grow up, blind, deaf, dumb, and ignorant to the realities and the truth that are surrounding us that black people know nothing about. So this man came um, into a life of crime. When he was on the street, they called him Detroit Red. And we know that he was into pimping black women, um, selling black women to white men in Harlem so that white men could fulfill their fantasy of being with a black woman. If you read the autobiography of Malcolm X, he recounts one instance where all this white man wanted uh, the black woman to do was sprinkle powder on him so that he could have his sexual pleasure by a black woman sprinkling powder on him. This is the type of lifestyle that our brother was living before he came in contact with the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. He was a numbers runner which was the illegal gambling that was taking place at that time. He was a real pimp. See, today, a brother may say, you know, I'm a pimp, I'm a pimp. But he's not really a pimp. He's just a, a young man or, that may have a couple of girlfriends, and he calls himself a pimp. But a pimp is a man that owns women, sells those women to men for sex, 
and then gets the money from those women and treats those women like a piece of property. And if they don't give him the money, then she meets the back of his hand or he may burn the back of her legs with a, with a coat hanger or something. You know, that's what a pimp does. So this is what Malcolm X was doing. He was a numbers runner. He used to break in people's houses and rob them blind, sometimes while they were in the house, sometimes while they weren't in the house. So this is the type of life that Malcolm X was living before he met the teachers of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But he went to jail in 1942. And when he went to jail, then his brother, not anybody named Brother Baines, as the movie falsely depicts. There's no person in the history of Malcolm X's life named Brother Baines. That's a lie that's in the movie. But his brother Reginald came to him while he was in prison and introduced him to the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And the teachings were so powerful that here's a man that went to jail and got the nickname of Satan while he was in jail. On the street, he was Detroit Red, Red, Dirty Red. But when he went to jail, the convicts, the pimps, the hustlers, the gangbangers, the rapists, the pedophiles, the murderers, the serial killers, the bank robbers, they're the ones who gave this man the nickname of Satan. So he must have been a bad man. Right. But the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings are so powerful that they went into prison and didn't convert Detroit Red because he wasn't bad enough. Right. Dirty Red wasn't bad enough. Not bad enough brother. They had to wait till this man became Satan and his teachers converted Satan in prison and made him a model prisoner and transformed him from a worthless Negro, which we all were, into a world leader. Yeah. That's the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and their power. Yes, sir. I, I would have to agree with you. I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned uh, the discrepancy with, with, with this fictional character that was in the Malcolm X movie known as Baines, right. who uh, played really a pivotal role in the movie, but really did not exist in the actual life of Malcolm X. Right. Could you maybe point out some other discrepancies that uh, were in the movie that did not jive with the actual historical facts of Malcolm X's life? Uh, one discrepancy in the movie um, is that Malcolm X was poor while he was in the Nation of Islam. This is one of the discrepancies that Spike Lee put in the movie. You see where he's talking to his wife and his children don't have any clothes and she's complaining. And Malcolm X was in no way poor. All of his bills, because, see, what people don't understand is the relationship that yes, Malcolm X had with the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. It was a father-son relationship. Here's a man who was in prison, came out as an ex-con. Now, there are a lot of brothers right now that are ex-cons, that are coming out of prison, can't get a job. Family members looking at them crazy. You come over your house, you hiding the jewelry because Ray Ray came home from jail. Because we look at ex-cons in this society in a certain way. But the most honorable Elijah Muhammad never looked at Malcolm X like that. While he was in jail, he wrote him a letter or wrote him letters, sent him money while he was in prison. Something that many of us don't do by our own families. Most of us right. have people in jail right now that we are related to. And we don't, do, we don't write them a letter. We don't send them any money. We don't care about them. But this is the man that cared for Malcolm, wrote Malcolm, sent him money while he was in prison. When Malcolm X came out of prison, he helped him find a place to live, told him what to study while he was in prison. See, these type of things are not shown in the movie so that when they want to tell you the lie that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has something to do with the assassination of Malcolm X, then you'll believe it. But this man treated Malcolm X like a son. They had a father-son relationship. So that's never shown in the movie. In the movie, it portrays Malcolm X as being poor. But what they don't tell you is that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad paid Malcolm X a salary of $1,000 a week. $1,000 a week. Brother, this is in, in the 1960s. It's 2005, and you know, I'm a Chicago public school teacher. I don't get paid $1,000 a week right now in 2005. This man also paid the mortgage on Malcolm X's house where he lived in a mini mansion in yes, New sir. Rochelle, New York. Paid the bills in the house. Yes, brought sir. Malcolm X the newest Lincoln Continental that was out and paid the car note and the insurance on the car. Showing you that he had nothing but love for Malcolm X. Yes, sir. But the movie does not show you that relationship. The movie tries to make it seem as though Malcolm X is poor. So these are just some of the discrepancies in the movie. In the movie, there's a vision that Malcolm X has of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad while he's in jail. But if you read the autobiography of Malcolm X, he never had a vision of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad while he was in jail. Never had a he had a vision of Master Farad Muhammad, who was the teacher of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So all of that the, and many other things are just not true.
Yes, sir. And that, that's, go ahead, sir. Well, tell us a little bit more about the relationship. And uh, maybe um, we, we see, you know, from the conversion of Malcolm X being Detroit Red, right. Satan, and then going to Malcolm X, and then not only going from Malcolm X to becoming a, a minister and, 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 a, and a national and world leader. Right, right. What was the step process that, that uh, with, with this relationship with the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, how did that come about? See, when Malcolm X was in prison, his family had joined the Nation of Islam. They had become Muslims. Reginald, Filbert, Wilbert, Ella, they had all joined the Nation of Islam. And they wanted to bring Malcolm X into the Nation of Islam. So they went to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and asked, would he, if Malcolm X wrote him, would he write him back? and correspond with him. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, being a lover of his people, obliged him, and he did write Malcolm X while he was in prison on a regular basis. We read in the autobiography of Malcolm X the various books that Malcolm X read while he was in prison. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told Malcolm X while he was in prison what he wanted him to study because he was shaping him while he was in prison to become a representative of his teachings. So when Malcolm X came out of prison, shortly thereafter, he was made a minister in Detroit, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad used him to spread Islam all over the country. And see, people have to understand the wisdom of a man like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and what he was trying to do in exalting Malcolm X and making him a world leader. While Malcolm X was out front handling the press, representing the nation of Islam in the forefront, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad was behind the scenes building a real nation for black people. Yes, sir. If you line up the accomplishments of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and what he was able to do on behalf of the black man and woman in North America, there is no leader living or dead that can match this man's work on behalf of black people. Here's a man that started a black owned and operated newspaper that sold a million copies of issue, opened 42 independent Muhammad University of Islam's for black people, independent education for black people, built hundreds of businesses all across the United States for black people, purchased millions of acres of farmland in this country for black people, grew food for black people, opened a chain of grocery stores for black people, and the list goes on and on and on. So he had Malcolm X as the out front man representing the nation while he was behind the scenes building a nation and a new reality for the black man and woman here in America. Most leaders don't even think like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was able to act. Here's a man that was entered into no negotiations to purchase the entire south side of Chicago for black people. Leaders today don't even think like that. We have millionaires today. They're not using their money to do anything to help uplift us as a people. They're using their money to have parties, using their money to buy a house in the Hamptons, but not using their wealth and their fame and their popularity to build a nation for the black man and woman. But that is exactly what the most honorable Elijah Muhammad did. And Malcolm X represented the nation in the forefront. Absolutely. And, 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 and tell me this, brother. Um, we, we, we hear a lot of Malcolm X speeches, a lot of quotes, and we hear about Malcolm X. How long was Malcolm X actually in the nation of Islam and, and, and different speeches and the quotes would it, while he was in the nation, or, 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 or what, what actually happened? Well, brother, uh, the Malcolm X that most people love is the Malcolm X in the Nation of Islam. The man who said, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. That's yes, the Malcolm X in the Nation of Islam. The man who said, we didn't come on the Nina, the Penta, or the Santa, Santa Maria. Maria. We came in the holes of slave ships. That's the Malcolm X in the Nation of Islam. Yes, the sir. man you see on Lenox Avenue teaching hard with hundreds of thousands of our people standing around listening. That's the Malcolm X in the Nation of Islam. That's the man that we fell in love with. That's the man that most of us love to this day is the Malcolm X that was in the Nation of Islam. The Malcolm X that stood up to the police in New York City and won the biggest police brutality suit in the history of New York at that time. That's the Malcolm X in the Nation of Islam. That's the man that we fell in love with. The man that was taught and trained at the foot of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and took what the honorable Elijah Muhammad taught him and affected the entire world. A man that came out of prison and was made into a world leader. Now you know that if you join the NAACP as an ex-con, they're not gonna make you the leader. Right. And if, you, if you join the Urban League straight out of prison, and you are, you are a gangbanger, a former gangbanger, or a prostitute, you're not gonna become the leader of the NAACP. You join the church. They're not gonna put you over the choir in the church as an ex-con. 
They may be put somebody who's living an alternative lifestyle over the choir, <laughs> but they're not going to put the ex-con over the choir because there's a stigma against ex-cons. But here's a man who came out of prison Go ahead. and was meeting presidents and rulers as a representative of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. When Fidel Castro came to New York City, he met with Malcolm X. When Kwame Nkrumah came to America, he met with Malcolm X. When the president or the king of Saudi Arabia came to America, he had lunch with Malcolm X in New York. Here's a man that came out of prison and with what Elijah Muhammad taught him became a world leader. No one can deny that. Right. Uh, th there are many people that say that they are followers of Malcolm X and that they, and they believe in Malcolm X and, and whatnot. What did Malcolm actually stand for? And what would, what, to be a true follower, if you're saying you're a follower of Malcolm X, what would you stand for? Well, there's a lot of things. Um, if you're a follower of Malcolm X, you have to stand for the respect and the protection of black women That's and right. black children. Malcolm X wasn't a disrespecter of the black woman. So you can't, um, on the one hand, be in the club getting tipsy, you know, with a few <laughs> half-naked sisters, and then talking about you with Malcolm X at the same time. Right. You can't be rolling a blunt, you know, sitting back smoking a Dutch, talking about you with Malcolm X at the same time, because those things don't go together. You can't be, you know, popping bottles of Chris, you know, um, talking about you with Malcolm X at the same time. See, Malcolm X stood for truth and the liberation of the black man and woman, and anything that doesn't liberate us, which those things I mentioned don't, they destroy right. our community, then how can you be with Malcolm and you're for those things? Right. You got a white girlfriend talking about I'm with Malcolm X. Right. You Come on. With a, with a pork chop sandwich. Right. With a ham sandwich in your hand. Right. You know? That's but not what Malcolm X represented. I, I had a question in, uh, to ask you because, you know, in, in the movie, it, it kind of portrayed uh, Malcolm, you know, different various reasons for Malcolm leaving the Nation of Islam. Right. And so I wanted you maybe to clear up some of the myths because uh, the movie industry has worked to uh, uh, push falsehood out here. Um, the the uh, newspapers have pushed it out here. And many uh, so-called black scholars mm -hmm. uh, who have been uh, have flawed scholarship have also done the same thing uh, to put out falsehood and to, and to portray it wrong. But what are some of the myths surrounding uh, Malcolm X's uh, departure from the structure of the Nation of Islam. Well, brother, we cannot study the history of our struggle in America, especially during the Civil Rights Movement, without studying the wicked plans of the United States government against the rise of black people. There is a plan that the government developed under the leadership of J. Edgar Hoover, who was over the FBI, called COINTELPRO, which is the counterintelligence program. And the counterintelligence program was started in 1956. And the purpose at that time was to destroy the Communist Party. And the way they worked in the Communist Party was they sent their agents in, they infiltrated the Communist Party, got the Communist Party fighting and killing each other, and then FBI agents became, and then the Communist Party split in two. And then FBI agents became leaders of both parts. What? And they used their role as the leader to destroy the Communist Party to where there was no more Communist Party left. That's how the FBI rolled against the Communist Party. Right. So once they saw that it was successful against the Communist Party, when blacks started to rise in the 50s and 60s, J. Edgar Hoover used the same tricks, even worse tricks, because when the black people started to rise, he said to his agents that there is no hold bar against the rise of black people. Anything, things that were illegal to do against the Communist Party, you can do them to black people. So they didn't, they didn't hold anything back in their effort to destroy the rise of black people in every organization that was developed in the 1960s. Every one of them was destroyed by the wicked hand of the United States government and the FBI. So you can't study the life of Malcolm and the history of the Nation of Islam without studying the role of the government and what they did to try to destroy the Nation of Islam. And the reason that Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam is because the FBI worked night and day to remove Malcolm X from the Nation of Islam according to the FBI's own words. Right. Now I'm gonna to quote to you a man who was the um, special agent in charge of the Chicago Department of the FBI. His name was Marlon Johnson. Special agent in charge of the Chicago uh, 
Department of the FBI, he said that the scheme to divide Malcolm X from the most honorable Elijah Muhammad was the most notable in the history of the FBI. Meaning this was the greatest scheme that had ever taken place to divide two people in the history of the FBI. That's straight from the mouth of the FBI. Right. So, but see, the government what, what, and the enemy and the so-called scholars, they don't tell you what the government did to try to destroy the nation of Islam. Right. They don't somebody, reveal that. Where can somebody find this information? This can be found in the FBI files. There's books that you can read. There's the COINTELPRO papers by Ward Churchill. There's uh, J. Edgar Hoover, The Man in the Secrets. There's uh, the FBI files on Malcolm X by Claiborne Carson. But all of these things have various things that the government did to try to destroy the nation of Islam in these documents. But you have to read through them with a fine tooth comb. Right. Because it's all there. Right. I believe we have a caller. We're going to uh, receive a caller. Go ahead, sir. Caller, you're going to have a talk to How you doing? Doing fine, sir. I'm enjoying the program. I think all three of you guys are doing a fantastic job um, putting out this information because we, uh, we really need it in, this, in today's, today's time. I want to ask, um, what, what do you think about the, uh, the blacks that think that um, or feel there's no racism in America and it goes along, you know, um, with white uh, supremacy and try to assimilate, you know, some, for example, like a Condoleezza Rice or Colin Powell. And uh, another uh, question I want to ask is, um, where can I get a, uh, or is there is there um, a book of a, uh, the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and where can it be found? And uh, that's my two questions. And once again, I think y'all doing a fantastic job. Thanks. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, there, there is a book uh, that kind of capsulates the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It is called Message to the Black Man. It, it's a you must know? read for must every read. black person yes, sir. in America. Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, and Central Hemisphere. Every black person needs to get that book, Message to the Black Man, which will give you the, uh, uh, as you said, capsulizing the teachings of That's the right. Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Absolutely. And the brother's other question was about blacks that try to assimilate. Well, you know, brother, in this country, we were made blind, deaf, and dumb. <laughs> so oh, yeah. since we were made blind, deaf, and dumb, you know, the majority of us are going to try to assimilate, and that's how it's been, you know, and things are changing because the truth is getting out there to our people. But see, the best thing that we can do, brother, is spread this truth to as many of our people as we possibly can. Because the only reason that you have a Condoleezza and a Colin Powell is because we didn't get to them with the truth yet. Hopefully <laughs> that's the only reason. Go ahead. It may be a couple of other reasons. We don't want to get into that. But the best thing we can do is spread this truth because, you know, the people who are trying to assimilate, you know, their world is crashing all around them. So, you know, we have people that try to fit in and try to say, well, there's no more racism, but all they have to do is open their eyes. What happened to Abner Louima? Is that an example of no more racism? When uh, our people are being beat up by the police left and right, is that an example of no more racism? Racism is everywhere. When you have a million and a half black people in prison right now, male and female, that's racism right there. That's institutional racism. So we still suffer from racism, but... As I said, brother, we've been made so blind, deaf, and dumb that we don't even see that we're the victims of the greatest crimes in the history of the world. Right. Now, uh, brother, you, um, you, you, you definitely woke us up when you told us about how the government actually, through, uh, through, the, through the FBI and the Operation Dirty Tricks and Lies, right, right. Uh, how they actually went about to try to, to cause a, a split and a rift between right, the right. Mosul Elijah Muhammad and... Uh, Malcolm X. Yes, let me just give you some examples. See, there was a rumor in the Nation of Islam that Malcolm X was trying to take over the Nation of Islam because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had Malcolm X out front on the television, in the media, representing the Nation of Islam. But in the FBI files, it reveals that it was the FBI agent that started the rumor that Malcolm X was trying to take over the Nation of Islam so that a sincere person hearing that would think if they love the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, then they may look at Malcolm X differently because they think now, well, he's trying to take over the nation and get rid of the honor Elijah Muhammad. But that was a rumor that That's was right. started by the FBI. And this is why 
with these rumors and slack talk and gossip and backbiting, that is what destroys black organizations. And the government sends people in to start rumors, start gossip, start backbiting to destroy our unity. And it's, it works every time. And we fall for it hook, line and sinker. The, the root or the lie that the nation of Islam are not real Muslims. You hear foolish people saying the nation of Islam, they ain't real Muslims. Well, then if we're not the real Muslim, who is the real Muslim? That's right. That's the Arab that's selling pig to our people in the community? The Arabs that own the store that are selling our people alcohol and beer, are they the real Muslims? And crack and put, the, and put the pig under the counter and then leave and go to Jumai prayer, but won't invite the black man and woman to Jumai prayer? Is that the real Muslim? <laughs> now, that's not the real Muslim. The real Muslim <laughs> is the one that's living the life of the Holy Quran. But that rumor was started right. by the FBI. Right to try to destroy the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's effort when he went to the Middle East and to Mecca in 1959, the FBI started the rumor that the Nation of Islam are not real Muslims. You have fools in 2005 repeating that same rumor that we're not real Muslims. If we're not real Muslims, who is the real Muslim? Yeah, I, I wanted to, to cover this because I think it's key. Because a lot of people believe that when Malcolm uh, left and went over to the Middle East, that he came to some transformation and all of a sudden became accepting of white people, believing them to be his brothers in faith, so to speak, and that he was transformed by that experience because, you know, he may have never seen uh, people with white skin that were actually, as a, as a religion, actually had Islam as their religion. Right. So uh, I, I wanted you to maybe, maybe go into that because a lot of people believe that, a lot of people repeat that. Right. And I think, I think we need to deal with that also. Well, brother, what people have to understand is that in 1959, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad sent Malcolm X to the Middle East to represent the nation of Islam. When he went in 64, that was his second time going to the Middle East. He went already in 1959. And when he went, he saw white Muslims then. When the president of Saudi Arabia came to America to meet with Malcolm X while he was in the nation of Islam, the president of Saudi Arabia is a white, or was a white Muslim at that time. So we can't say, or Malcolm can't say that he saw white Muslims and he saw, well, that Elijah Muhammad had lied because he said that the white man couldn't be a Muslim. In fact, when Malcolm X went to the Middle East in 1959, he brought slides back to New York City and showed in the mosque where there was racism in the Middle East. And there's racism then, and there's racism there now. Right. So the fact that he went to Mecca or went to the Middle East is not the reason he left the nation of Islam because he had seen white Muslims and we were already taught that there were white Muslims by faith. Right. Absolutely. We're going to go to the phone lines very quickly. Caller, you're going to have a community talk show. Caller? Yes, sir. You're on the air? Uh, you television down a Yes, sir. I've been listening to... Every now and then I, I, I flip my channel to Channel 5 and I see so many of you, some talking about this and that, and da 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 da. Uh, one gentleman made a comment about racism. I don't know how well y'all know about <laughs> racism or whatever, but I'm li I've been living 64 years and from my experience, Black people are more racist among themselves than the white man is. You got your, your different organizations. You got your different, uh, uh, what, what is what you call religions. Are, are, you, are, you, are you a black or white man? I'm, I'm a black man, sir. You're a black man? Okay. And, you know, and from, from, from my experience in life, places I've been throughout the United States, sir, from east to west, black people are more racist among themselves than the white man is. You see what I'm saying? I don't know how, how or what group y'all belong to. I listen to all kinds. What is it that you, you all are trying to do? What is it that you need? What is it you want? What do you think you're going to get done? That's what I'd like to find out. What okay. is it that you're looking for? Okay, we, we definitely can tell you. Thank you so much for your call. We're, we're looking for the total liberation, both mentally, spiritually, and physically, of the black man and woman of America and, and the entire world. We want all of our people to be free thinking and free acting in accordance with the ordinances, statutes, and commandments of the one true and living God. 
We want our people to be self-respecting people who love themselves as black people and can appreciate what God has made of them. And when you say that black people are racist among themselves, I would have to say uh, you're absolutely right, that we do have a color issue. But if you look in the uh, latest issue of The Final Call, it deals with the Willie Lynch letter and how Willie Lynch uh, carried out and, and, and talked about a plan where you divide black people by color, divide them by age, divide them by the size of plantation. And these, these things have continued to divide us, but it's only something that has been injected within us from the outside. And what we have attempted to do and are attempting to do, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said years ago, is to get that devil out of us, to perform a mental and spiritual operation on the black nation so that we can clear ourselves of the impurities that have been put within us which cause us to act other than our own selves. That's what we want. We want freedom. We want land that we can call our own. We want our children educated uh, in accordance with our own education system. We want the same things as, as any people, freedom. Right. There, there are many impediments to us coming together and unifying. We talk about it on this show many, many times. We talk about how the Vietnamese people and the, and the, and the, and the Arabs and how all these people come into our community and work together to come up, to become millionaires and, 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 and form a living off our community. And we talk about within our own selves how their, their impediments, the, 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 one, one made the comment, one, one person said, the hate that hate made. You that's know what right. I'm saying? And that's the hate that we have, the hate for our own self. No longer does a, a, a Ku Klux Klan person have to come and lynch us. You know what I'm saying? Come on now. It becomes our own self that mm -hmm. want to kill our own brother. That's you right. You know? And that's the hate that we have inside ourselves, and that's what we're addressing. That's why we talk about these issues of blackness. Why? Because we hate ourselves because we don't know ourselves. Right. The knowledge of self will be the, 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 the factor uh, that, we must, that we must get to be able to have a thorough love for ourselves. Right. That's right. why we talk about where black people come from. That's why we talk about what's really going on, that black people are really not the criminals that they say we are. We, that's why we talk about our rich history, our rich culture, our, all the inventions that we've all the good contributions that we have right here in America. Why? Because in the school system right here in Lafayette, we don't get that. That's right, yeah. brother. You know, so <laughs> it becomes a killing field. When you teach a little baby against themselves, when a little baby goes to church, all they see is these white faces, these white angels, they're so good. And they turn on the news and they see all these black people marching off to jail. You know what I'm saying? Right. The, the only thing they're able to grab for is I want to rap. I want to be a, a, a basketball player. Right. You know actor. what I'm saying? An right. actor. That's the only thing that they see to, openly mo to, to, uh, to do something with their life. So we have to teach them the thorough knowledge of who they are and the great benefits right. of who they are and where this hate came from. That's, right, That's what bro. we're teaching in here today, where this hate came from. What I, and learning about our great brother, who was a great soldier in, unwaking, uh, in waking up a, a lot of minds. And it was interesting in waking myself, my brother, my other brother here. Malcolm X did a lot of great things, and we need to understand the history. Because our enemy has oh, yeah. taken this great man, Malcolm X, and use him as a weapon against us. Right. And so against that, our unit. And against our unit. Because here we have a man today, Minister Farrakhan, Go ahead. that's doing a work to the like and greater than Malcolm ever did. Right. Go ahead, Malcolm never called a million men to Washington, D.C. <laughs> Malcolm never called a million more movement. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. But here you have a, a man, Minister Farrakhan, taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, raised up in the same process that Malcolm was raised. Go ahead, bro. And now you want to use Malcolm X against this man. No, we say no, we're not going to let that happen. Right, right. Go right. ahead, bro. Go ahead and take that call, bro. Okay, we're going to go back to the phone line. Not going to let it happen. Call in now with Kim to talk to him. Oh, how you doing, man? Doing fine, sir. I just like to say that I appreciate the, the, um, the show. And it's, it's good to know that um, you do have black people that's trying to, you know, look out for their own people. And there's nothing wrong with that. And um, I think that white people are doing it, but they're doing it undercover. You know, of right. course, they, they, they've been doing it for years, and they're going to keep doing it. They're not just, they're not going to be like you all, you know, man enough to come out and, and, and speak the truth, you yes, know. Sir. And um, I might sound ignorant. What I'm about to ask, but I just want to know, like, a little bit about, like, Muslims, you know, because I read on the Internet, there's so many different, um, there's different 
different things going on, you know. So I just want to hear out the horse's mouth, like with with you know, what do you all follow or you know, or what do you all believe in? I know about um, Allah. Right. I'm not sure if if that's the, a Muslim God or is it, is it the same God that the Christians and the Jews worship? Right. And um, so you know, just just break it down a little bit. And um, I don't. I think it's Muhammad. Yes, sir. Bacon. Um, was was he a black man or? Um, I, I don't know if his name is Muhammad or not. Yes, sir. Well, brother, when, the one that was um, that was like uh, born in 500 AD, I think it was. Yes, sir. Okay, so I mean, just just explain it just a little bit. Yes, sir, brother. Well. You know, we believe in the one God whose proper name is Allah as Muslims. And see, as black people, we have been robbed of our original tongue, which is the Arabic language. So when we hear the name Allah and we hear the word Muslim, those are Arabic words that we're not familiar with. But in English, you would say God. In Spanish, you would say Dios. In Greek, you would say Theos. In Arabic, you would say Allah. So Allah is the same God that you read about in the Bible. The Bible was not written in English. You have an English translation, but in the Hebrew, he was called Elo. You follow what I'm saying? So we believe in the one God whose proper name is Allah. We're Muslims, and all that means is one who submits his or her will to do the will of God, which every prophet that you read about in the Bible, from Abraham to Jesus, Moses, Noah, Lot, all of them submitted their will to do God's will, which would make them a Muslim. But that's all it means in English. So that's something of what we believe very briefly. And what was the other, brother's, what was the other part of his question? He asked about Muhammad. Who, who was Muhammad? Oh, and was Prophet Muhammad black? of 1,400 years ago, he was one of the prophets of Islam who taught the Arabs in Arabia the teachings of Allah in the Holy Quran. And he was not a black man. He was a white man. Many of the prophets were black. But Prophet Muhammad was a white man who believed in the one God whose proper name is Allah. See, brother, we, we are now no respecter of person necessarily, but we're not going to accept the lie that we've been told about Jesus, that he was white when we know, in fact, that he was black. But Prophet Muhammad of 1400 years ago was a white man, the honorable Elijah Muhammad, who is teaching us Islam. He is a black man and the honorable Louis Farrakhan as well. Absolutely, brother. We're going to go back to the phone lines very briefly. Calling your name, Community Talk Show. Yes, how you doing? Doing fine, sir. How you Good. doing, brother? I have uh, a two-part question. I would like to know if uh, the nation of Islam is a faith or if it's a religion. And if so, if do you guys uh, put the Elijah Muhammad before God? Because the Bible also says that you push, please no man before me. And I notice a lot of Muslims do that. Uh, if you can help me out with that, could you please enlighten me. Thank you, sir. Well, brother, um, the Nation of Islam, you can call it a religion as such, but it's not really a religion. It's really a way of life. And what God gives, he doesn't give a religion. If you read the Bible, he doesn't say, well, the religion of Adam was or the religion of you can't read anywhere in the Bible where God names the religion of his prophets. The religion that God gave man in the beginning was to obey me. That's what God always says. Obey me. And in the nation of Islam, we don't put the honorable Elijah Muhammad above God. God is supreme in the nation of Islam. We believe, as I just told the last caller, in the one God whose proper name is Allah. But we have to recognize the fact that we would not know about the God unless God sent a man to tell us about him. This is why you have Jesus in the Bible, because the people were off the path. And God sent Jesus to bring them back on the path. So we honor and respect Jesus, but we know that Jesus was leading us to God. We honor and respect no Moses, but we know that Moses was leading us to God. We honor and respect Abraham, but we know that Abraham was leading us to God. And the same with us today. We honor and respect the honorable Elijah Muhammad. But all he was doing was leading us to Almighty God. So we don't put him above God but we recognize his great work on behalf of God. Uh, there's, something, there's something that I, I want us to make sure that we get to. Yes, sir. And that is uh, the question that I had jotted down right here because uh, as we deal with this issue of Malcolm X, many people want to know 
how did the assassination go down? What happened with the assassination? And in one of your very good uh, lectures that, it, that, is, that is out uh, in the public, you, a you actually go into the assassination starting with the day that uh, Malcolm X's uh, home, or should I say the home that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad had put him in right. was actually firebombed. Yes, sir. Well, let me, let me start there that. on February 14th, 1965. The home of, the, of Malcolm X was firebombed. And when Malcolm X came out of his house and the news reporters were there, they asked him, who firebombed your house? And Malcolm X said that you know who it was. It was the Nation of Islam. It was the Muslims. And the media who helped to facilitate the strife between Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam, they took that and they put that all over the world. But see, what people don't realize is that the New York Police Department and Fire Department tried to blame Malcolm X for firebombing his own house. Come on now. And when Malcolm X was being blamed by the New York Police Department and Fire Department for firebombing his own house, let me read to you what Malcolm X said of his own words that he said. This is straight from the mouth of Malcolm X. The more I keep thinking about this thing, the things that have been happening lately, I am not all, I'm not all that sure that it is the Muslims. I know what they can do and what they can't. And they can't do some of the stuff going on. I think I'm going to quit saying that it's the Muslims. Malcolm X's sister, Ella, when she found out that the fire department, in fact, she, the neighbors told her right. that they saw the fire department walking in with Molotov cocktails that had not been lit. And they put those Molotov cocktails on, the, on his children's dresser to make it seem like he firebombed his own house. But the neighbors had gone in to get clothes for the children and there was no Molotov cocktail there. So when the neighbors saw the fire department Man. bring in Molotov cocktails so they could blame Malcolm X for the firebombing of his own house, she said, this is Malcolm X's sister, that it was no longer the Muslims. That's February 14th, 1965. The day when that happened, the Muslim Mosque Incorporated took over Malcolm X's internal security. Hmm. It was taken over by the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Hmm. Now, there's a leader, or not a leader, but he was a man who was over the CIA for about 25 years. His name is Colonel Fletcher Powtry. And he said that any time a leader is assassinated, it's because someone in the inner guard allowed that leader to be assassinated. Come on now. That's what he said in a speech called An Anatomy of an assassination. Colonel Fletcher Powtry over the CIA for 25 years. Anytime a leader is assassinated, yes, sir. it is because the lack security in the inner guard of that leader. Come on. So now. on February 14th, Muslim Mosque Incorporated took over Malcolm X's security. Malcolm X requested on February 14th police surveillance 24 hours a day, seven days a week because he knew that someone was trying to take his life, right? Right. Now, you fast forward from February 14th, one week later to February 21st, 1965, and Malcolm X is speaking in the Autobahn ballroom. Yes, sir. And when Malcolm X comes out to speak, there's a disruption in the audience, hmm. right? Yes, sir. But what we have to realize is on February 21st, 1965, that was the first day that the order was given not to check anybody coming into the Autobahn ballroom. And the order was suggested to Malcolm X by his chief security, Gene Roberts, who was working for the New York Police Department while he was Malcolm X's chief security. The man's guard. chief right. security worked for Gene the government. Gene Roberts was working for the government, who later on went to um, get some of the Black Panthers. He was, he was the, the agent that got the Black Panthers arrested in New York City in the Panther 21 trial. Same agent, man. Gene Roberts. So he tells Malcolm that the people are offended by the check. So Malcolm, who was confused at that time, gets rid of the check procedure, which if you come to any event hosted by the Nation of Islam, you know there's a weapons check. Right. That's right. On February 21st, Malcolm X gets rid of it. So the only people that know there's not going to be a weapons check are the people that are a part of Malcolm X's inner guard and Malcolm X himself. So for the assassins to be able to find out that there was not going to be a weapons check, someone in that inner guard had to let the assassins know. Man. Right. So not only that, but then Gene Roberts, the government agent, tells all of Malcolm X's security not to bring any weapons with them to the Autobahn Ballroom on February 21st, 1965. Now, why did they do that? Because, see, it's, it's difficult if I have a gun and you don't have a gun 
for you to try to secure somebody. You know, you're not going to challenge me for the most part. Yes, sir. If I have a gun and you don't. You follow what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So he tells all of the security, do not bring any weapons to the Autobahn ballroom. The only security guard that didn't listen was Reuben Francis, and he brought his gun. <laughs> so now when Malcolm X comes to the podium, there are five people, excuse me, involved in his assassination. Two men create a diversion in the back of the Autobahn ballroom, and the diversion was just a trick to get everybody to turn around. Yes, sir. So that the assassins could come up and shoot Malcolm X while everybody was turned around. Now, on February 21st, the media would sit on the front row of the Autobahn ballroom. Yes, sir. But on February 21st, the media was put on Malcolm X's left, no, Malcolm X's right in the Autobahn ballroom on the side of the Autobahn ballroom, and the front rows were left open for the assassins to sit in. See, someone in Malcolm X's inner guard had to make the call to move the media from the front row to stage left or to stage right for Malcolm X. You follow yes, what I'm saying? So now, the diversion is created in the back of the Autobahn ballroom. Get your hand out of my pocket. Right, that was the diversion. And everybody turns around. And I have the, um, the grand jury testimony of Sister Betty Shabazz here. And Betty Shabazz admitted in her grand jury testimony. He said, and when you heard that sound, what you just said. Get, get your hand out of my pocket. For those words, did you turn around and look? And Sister Betty Shabazz says, yes, I turned around and looked. And what did you see? I saw a man standing. I could see his back, sandy jacket on, uh, more of a rust color. So she turns around and looks, and everybody in the ballroom turned around and looked except the assassins. So the assassins got up out of their seat. The three men, you two created diversion. Yes, sir. Three had the guns, right? Yes, sir. The two that created a diversion, one throws down a smoke bomb. The three men come and fill Malcolm X full of lead, right? Yes, sir. So Malcolm X is dead. Now keep in mind that Gene Roberts, his chief of security was on Malcolm X's um, stage post. Yes, sir. But before Malcolm X came out to speak, he relieves himself and he goes to stand by the back door of the Autobahn ballroom. So you have another man that's standing next to Malcolm X. The diversion is created in the audience now, these are former members of the Nation of Islam who have been trained on how to do security. That's right. Muslim Mosque Incorporated were former members of the Nation of Islam who left the nation to follow Malcolm. Good. So the men that are on Malcolm X's right and left leave the stage and go into the crowd, which is against any security protocol. That's right. Now, how do we know? We have the grand jury testimony right here of Sister Betty Shabazz. Go ahead. And this is what she has to say. Um, the man, the, the lawyer asked, and then what happened? And I heard my husband say, everything's all right. Everything's all right. The guards that were in front went to see what the commotion was. Then the lawyer says, you are referring to the men who were assigned to protect your husband. Is that correct? And she says, yes. So the men who were assigned to protect Malcolm X left the stage, left him there to be shot. Right. Left and the they prison. went into the crowd, which is against any security that, protocol. That's right. That's right. a no. You know that you're supposed to protect the principal and get them to the nearest exit. That's, that's right. right. So in the commotion, then all five men run towards the door where the government agent, Gene, Gene X. Roberts. Roberts, is standing, making sure that all the assassins get out. But see, Reuben Francis brought his gun to the ballroom against the orders of the government agent, Gene Roberts. Come on now. So Reuben Francis shoots Talmadge Hare in the thigh and he's caught in the autobahn ballroom and the people are beating him up now malcolm x on february 14th asked for police security there were no police at the autobahn ballroom come on now there were no police around the autobahn ballroom now three of the assassins got away that day one man was caught outside of the autobahn ballroom and he was being beat up by the people and a police officer an off-duty police officer Go ahead. Named Patrolman Hoy, H-O-Y, was passing by the Autobahn ballroom and saw the people beating up one of Malcolm's assassins and got out of his car and arrested this man. And they took that man to the police station. Talmadge Hare was shot in the thigh. The police came and got him and took him to the hospital. Now, that means two men were arrested in the Autobahn ballroom. I have the microfilm right here from the New York Herald Tribune from February 21st and 22nd, 1965, and this is what it says. Malcolm X slain by gunmen as 400 in ballroom watch. Police rescue two suspects. Then the next day, it says, 
Malcolm X slain by gunmen as 400 in ballroom watch. Police rescue one suspect. Mm. What happened to the other one? The qu that's the question. What happened to the other suspect? He was the government agent. Come on now. That when they took him to the police station, they let him go because he was working for the government. So then, Gene Roberts comes from the door to Malcolm X, who's dying on the ballroom floor, and he starts to give Malcolm X mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. You don't do that when somebody's full of bullets. When somebody is shot, you don't give them mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Any paramedic will tell you that if someone is bleeding, you apply pressure to the wound to stop the bleeding. This I mean. man gives Malcolm X mouth-to-mouth -to, -mouth to make sure that he's dead. Right. He's blowing air into his mouth. To blowing him air into him to make sure that he's dead. Right. So that's really how it went down and what you, what you were looking at was a bunch of government agents who uh, Malcolm had trusted these agents and these agents actually set him up I'm going to tell you this. to be assassinated. The FBI, when Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam, they started a program called Black Pro to recruit black agents to infiltrate uh, the OAAU and the Muslim Mosque Incorporated so that what happened on February 21st, 1965 could happen. Right. Black Pro was designed to recruit black agents to infiltrate black organizations. Man, that, that's, that's a, a, some outstanding information. We're only stuff, scratching the surface stuff of who that, really assassinated Malcolm X. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, you want to take a call? Oh, yeah, we can take a call. <clears throat> yes, sir. Call in Avenue to talk to Yeah, uh, you just uh, cleared up a lot of things that, uh, you know, was on my mind, you know, when I was, like, trying to figure out a lot of things, you know, uh, about uh, Malcolm X's assassination. And uh, he cleared up a lot. But uh, I wanted to ask, you know, pertaining to the, the movie Malcolm X, uh, I, I enjoyed it until they showed um, uh, Elijah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and they tried to make it seem like he was having some type of affairs with uh, some of the female uh, um, you know, uh, people in, in the organization and stuff. And I just wanted to know uh, if that was really true or if it was just, you know, done to, like, spice up the, the movie or whatnot. Thanks. All right, thank you, Carl. Thank you for your call, brother. Well, brother, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we believe, as Malcolm X believed, that he is the messenger of Almighty God Allah. And if you read the Bible and the Holy Quran, the messengers of God at certain points in their lives were told by God to take on more wives, which is what happened in the life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Those sisters that Spike Lee tried to portray in the movie that he was messing around with were the wives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And they were treated like wives and respected like wives. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wasn't slipping around having sex with teenage secretaries as it was put by Malcolm X. In fact, Malcolm X knew that they were the wives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and defended the fact that, the, that a Muslim man is allowed more than one wife in the Holy Quran under certain circumstances. Uh, uh, tell me, do you know any of these wives, uh, any of the children from the wives? Brother, I know the, uh, some of the wives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and I know the children of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we have to understand that the children of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad by Mother Clara Muhammad are not helping the nation of Islam, not helping black people right now. But the children by the wives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad right now are in the struggle helping to liberate the masses of our people from the grip of Satan. So see, Allah God is a foreknower and saw down the line when the children of his messenger would be doing something else and he planned for that day. Right. I believe one of, one of the most Honorable Elijah Muhammad's sons by these uh, by, by, the, by, the, by his wives, one is the... Is, is the, the minister of Mas Mariam. One right. is the minister in Miami, Florida. One is the national secretary of the Nation of Islam. One is the minister of information in the Nation of Islam. His children are doing great things on behalf of the black nation. Right, right. Oh, absolutely. And that's some really good information. That's right. And it's best for us to hear the truth rather than hear the lie. Right. That's put right. out by an enemy to destroy what's happening right now. And they, let, let's let you address one more point before we go. Did Minister Farrakhan have anything to do? Brother, Minister Farrakhan had absolutely nothing to do with the assassination of Malcolm X. Here's a man that was friends with Malcolm X for 10 years. That's right. From 1955 to 1965, the, Malcolm X and the Honorable Louis Farrakhan had a relationship. See, but the enemy never talks about that relationship because they want us to believe that he had something to do with his assassination. Right. 20 seconds. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan, when he first came in the Nation of Islam, lived in Malcolm X's house with Malcolm X. Right. 
and was trained by Malcolm X, and they had a very close relationship. That's right, and we want to thank you for uh, listening to the Community Defender Talk Show. We want to thank you for tuning in as we heighten the level of discussion. Continue to tune in. We want to have our brother back uh, soon. Continue to listen to the Community Defender. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. That was a good one, brother. That was off the chain. <laughs> That was definitely good. Chain, bro. brother. Well, you put so much information Ooh. out at the end. Lord have mercy. Right. You know what brother. I'm saying? I don't know if, if they. Brother, that's scholarship, brother. <laughs> that's